you so much for being a cover tonight. Here on Good Nature. And we're going to start with a recap of last week's column. I don't know if you had a chance to read it or not, but um, concerned a little creature in Geneva. Um, any guesses? It is a weasel. Now, I have to tell you, I get a fair number of um, phone calls, emails, um, people sometimes just work it into the conversation. Pam, I've got a fill in the blank living in the porch, under the deck, up in the attic. I tell you, nine times out of a ten, ten, it's a rodent. And it's a rodent who does some kind of damage. Um, take, insurance companies don't cover rodent damage. So, um, these creatures like squirrels and mice and uh, voles, um, they, they cause all kinds of trouble. Uh, chipmunks too is a big one. Um, and the fellow who had the weasel show up, I told him he is living the dream of so many people who've had to deal with rodent problems. Uh, the gentleman was Neil Hancock. He is a teacher over at Wild Rose School. And I gotta tell you, Neil is just, he's a kind man, he's a gentle man. He, he wants everybody to get along and he, what he doesn't like to see is, is disembodied carcasses and, and heads and body parts laying around his yard. And that's uh, what this visitor brought him. So when, when Neil contacted me, he wasn't looking so much for information about this cool animal that he'd found under his porch. He wanted to know what he could do to get rid of it. Um, so um, we kind of talked over some options and, and really, this is kind of an important detail um, for those of you who might be considering removing the fill-in-the-blank animal from your porch, your deck, your attic, your shed, your garage. Um, it's kind of against the law. Um, Illinois has conservation laws that govern who can touch what and who can move what and who can collect what. And really, if you can think of all the wildlife, all the native wildlife that lives in Illinois as belonging to the state of Illinois, that kind of helps um, guide your decisions. Um, really, even if it's living in your house, it's not your animal. It does belong to the state. And that's why we have uh, licensed wildlife removal experts that can come in and they've got permits. Um, the, the problem with things like have a heart traps is that, yes, you're having a heart, you're not killing the animal, but the state uh, conservation laws would prevent you from moving that animal anywhere other than on your own property. Now, if, if it is just a simple matter of moving something from you know, the garage to the back of your lot, that's fine, but really whatever animal was in your garage, you're walking it you know, a couple hundred feet, isn't going to get rid of the problem. It's going to move right back. So, um, what I thought was interesting with with Neil is again, it was um, it's an animal that they're they're um, not really known to cause property damage. In fact, a lot of times they don't even dig their own hole. Um, Neil was fairly certain that there was no hole under his porch, but usually a long-tailed weasel, which is what he had, uh, will move into an abandoned burrow of some sort. Usually a chipmunk, um, they'll enlarge it just a little bit to get in and out, but um, they're weasel, so they are, um, their um, body said, this long-tailed weasel, um, uh, he thought this, this animal was about 16 inches long. Um, they're very narrow though, they're, picture a, you know, like a ferret, a pet ferret, they're uh, not quite as husky as a ferret, um, but they're made for going in burrows because that's uh, one of the uh, ways they hunt. Um, but then they'll also adopt those burrows as their own homes. So Neil um, and I talked it over on the phone and, and he uh, kind of changed the direction of his thinking after a while. Well, actually what, it, what happened was um, I was talking to him and his wife, well, I was talking to him, but he had me on the, the uh, speaker in his car. He and his wife were, were driving around and 
um, she was listening in and I said, you know, Neil, there's a chance that this weasel might be a female and she might have a litter of young under there. And that kind of changed the, the tide of the conversation because after that, once it wasn't just this, this uh, killer that was leaving body parts around the yard, all, you know, once you threw in that maternal aspect, I think that's really what kind of led them to decide that maybe it would be okay if the weasel stayed. Um, but uh, as it was, the weasel only stayed a, a few more days and then it moved on. So I'm wondering if, um, if, if, if it was a female, uh, if she chose a different place to have her young, or if it, it could have been a male as well. And males are a little bit more, um, uh, they tend to move around a little bit more, um, aren't as tied to one burrow all the time. Uh, Neil said that the house next to him was unoccupied. The uh, grass in the lawn, he said, looked like a wheat field. It hadn't been mowed all season. So uh, it could very well be that the weasel just decided that there's too much activity in the Hancock's yard and could just go next door to make its living. Um, but I wanted to explore just a little bit uh, what makes uh, these long-tailed weasels so fascinating. Um, now, um, I apologize, this was a, a Creative Commons image that I grabbed. This isn't a long-tailed weasel, it is a ermine. And ermine um, are very similar. Um, sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference, but uh, ermine uh, live a little bit farther north. They're in Wisconsin. They come very close to Illinois. Um, and they've, they've got a lot more fur on their feet and the tops of their feet are white you can kind of see uh, in this, this image here. Um, but we're gonna pretend for our purposes that this is a long-tailed weasel. It's carrying a vole, which Neil said he had this wonderful, he's about the only person I know who was happy to have voles living in his yard and talking voles with a V, so rodents uh, in his yard. Um, and the weasel ate pretty much all of them. But here's a, a weasel running away with a vole in its mouth and um, uh, to identify a long-tailed weasel, you're going to look for a kind of a, a light to medium brown color. It's going to have black at the end of its tail. Um, and it's a long-tailed weasel, so that tail is actually going to be about uh, something more than 40%. Um, I didn't quite word that correctly. There's the, the length of the weasel, and then there's the tail on the end of that. So if you take the, the the length, the, the body length of the weasel, 40% um, of that length is the additional tail length on the end. So um, Neil estimated his weasel was every bit of 16 inches and maybe more long. So that's about the size that we're talking about. Um, now they do um, change color in the winter. Um, the Weasel on the left is kind of changing. I don't know if it's going from brown to white or from white to brown, um, but the long-tailed weasel on the right is in the winter coloration. Everything on them changes to white except for that black tip on the tail. So um, if you see something like this in uh, say February, March, when the snow may be melted, but you see this little white creature, um, you're probably seeing a long-tailed weasel. Um, they, I, since I, I wrote that column, I've actually heard from a couple of people that have seen weasels. I um, worked at the park district for 13 years. I've written that column and um, there was Neil and then um, there was a woman in Batavia and then there was a, a woman who walks out at Eastside Sports Complex here in St. Charles and she saw one uh, stand up uh, just in this sort of posture, look around and then uh, lope away. When a weasel runs, they have a uh, kind of an up and down, uh, they got that long sinewy body. They uh, kind of move up and down as they as they run along. Tend to keep a kind of a low profile though. Uh, so the fact that more people are seeing them, you always kind of wonder, does that my, mean we have more? I, I can't answer that, I don't know for sure, but um, we definitely have weasels in the landscape. Now, I, I do have one other uh, picture here not great. I apologize. It was a uh, co-worker's cell phone picture from a few years back. Uh, we have in this area another weasel that's called a least weasel. 
And whereas uh, Neil, the long-tailed weasel that Neil had was, um, you know, close to a foot and a half long, the least weasel tops out at eight to 10 inches. It's got a shorter tail um, and they're, they're tiny little things. But boy, if you want rodent control, if you want to get rid of the mice in your garage, invite a least weasel in. Um, again, I don't have a, a good idea of their numbers, but this, this photo was taken in the garage at Hickory Knolls. Um, that's where we store a lot of the uh, native plant seeds that um, we distribute in our natural areas. Um, this was up in the rafters. When you have a lot of seeds being stored, you're going to have a lot of mice trying to outsmart you and try to get into the cans and the different places that we had the seeds stored at. Uh, and Greg uh, Pippus was the co-worker at the time he looked up and he saw this weasel um, and he said they had zero mouse problems that whole winter because of this uh, little creature. Now the least weasel does the same thing as the long-tailed weasel where it'll be brown in the summertime and it'll be um, uh, white in the winter. Uh, this picture was taken I believe in January. So they do stay active throughout the winter too. And uh, like I said, they are great for rodent control. So you got a problem with uh, mice in the grass, see if you can entice a, a weasel to come and pay you a visit. Now, um, I threw this uh, image and I've also got the, the book here. I tell you this, uh, Mammals of Illinois, it's getting somewhat dated. It um, was uh, published by the University of Illinois uh, several years ago, I wanna say maybe even in the 80s. Uh, where it gets dated, the animals themselves haven't changed, but the range maps each. Um, this has uh, a uh, kind of a biography of every mammal that's known to exist in the state of Illinois. And it's even got a chapter at the beginning about things that don't live here anymore, like bison and bears. And I think there's even some of the megafauna mentioned from the Ice Age. So he really you know, covers the gamut of mammals in Illinois. Um, it's a really neat reference to have. I believe there might be a field guide size um, version of the book. Um, the, the book I have here in the office looks like that, and it's a good, you know, 12 inches, uh, you know, 10 by 12 inches or so. It's not really something you take out with you in the field, but what's neat about it is that um, you can look up and, and get an idea of the, the uh, how common or how likely you are to see an animal. The range maps are by county. So you can get, even though, like I said, they're kind of dated, but you can kind of see where the animals, you know, is it a Southern animal? Is it a Northern animal? Is it statewide? But it's a neat reference. I'm super lucky. Um, a gentleman who belongs to King County Audubon has become a good friend, Paul Wiesler, was um, over at uh, the, St. Charles Library when they were having their annual book sale. And he picked off, he, he said he already had a copy, but he brought a copy here to the office, gave it to me for a buck. He got a copy of Hoffmeister's book for a buck. So um, if you're interested, I know these are on the use. I'm not sure that it's currently in print. I, I didn't um, check that um, before we started this evening, but I know you can get it in uh, um, used book sites. Um, a books, you can look it up there, but it's a neat reference to see uh, what animals, mammals live in Illinois. All right, we're gonna move on. Um, we've got a lot, a lot of things we wanna talk about. And guess what, we're gonna go back to cicadas again. I'm sorry, I know we talk about cicadas every week, but just in the last uh, week to 10 days, we've really started to hear um, our annual cicadas. And there's, uh, there's four species here. I, I, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on them. We're certainly not going to go into what they look like because they all they look the same or very similar. There's differences, but this picture is Linnae cicada. And um, there's, uh, you know, they're black, there's brown, there's green. Um, they're all, you know, a little bit smaller than your thumb. But listen to the difference in the sound. Uh, I'm going to play the recording. This is a Linnae cicada. Um, picture somebody ch -ch 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 shaking a salt shaker or um, ch -ch 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 
um, having one of those lawn sprinklers, you know, that sprays the uh, water around the yard. Um, I remember this sound belongs to the cicada by thinking, because Linnae refers to Linnaeus, the uh, king of taxonomy. I always think of this as Linnea likes salt. Kind of, some people say they hear maracas, but there's there's a kind of a kind of a warm up tone, and then they hit the the uh, salt shaker part, and then uh, it drones out at the end. But Linnae's cicada makes that sound. They're um, apt to call all day. Sometimes individuals pick a certain time of day to call, but this is a species that's known to call morning, afternoon, and um, into the uh, early evening too. Okay, now remember that sound because now we're going to listen to the dog day cicada. And I know you're thinking, well, gee, Pam, these are all dog days, especially what we've got coming up. I hear it's going to be in the 90s again, close to 100. So we are approaching those dog days of summer. Um, Canicularis is the species name for this cicada. Canicula, uh, canine, dog. Um, this is a very... Um, so it's a whiny buzz. Um, the way sure. I yeah. the dog day cicadas sound like this is um, the uh, dog days, especially when they go on for as long as they do, uh, can be kind of annoying. And so can the beep out. Got it? But one more time. It's a little bit shorter ball too. So whiny buzz. Um, pretty common in this area. Um, you see here we've got the descriptions of uh, Large, uh, we called our Linnae cicadas is kind of bigger. This one is kind of smaller. Those are very vague um, descriptions because it, it's hard to judge size. We have them uh, side by side. But um, this is a, a later um, singing species. They start usually after lunchtime and then they can go on until dusk. That's the dog day. Now, um, next up. We've got my personal favorite, which is the scissor grinder. The scissor grinder, now when I was a kid, and I don't know if any of you had the same experience, but uh, we had a, a guy that would come, he was always walking and pushing a cart. He always had a black jacket, black pants, black hat, and he pushed a black cart, but he was the scissor grinder man. And he would get a little bell on his cart and he'd just walk you know, along the, uh, right next to the curb in the street, and he had this, this uh, grinding wheel, and he'd you know, sharpen your knives, your scissors, um, and the, the wheel that he used had a real distinctive sound. Um, picture a grinding wheel going around and around and around, ah, and you're gonna uh, see why this is called the cicada. Got it? Kind of cyclical. Uh, cyclical sounds. Um, this is another species that doesn't get up too early. It generally is after lunchtime. That uh, afternoons is when you typically hear scissor grinders. I actually heard one um, last night just before as it was getting dark out. There was a, a few that were called. Uh, We've got, we've got one more. Uh, the lyric cicada. Now this, I, I hear this 
right here in downtown St. Charles. Um, they tend to um, like to live near water and First Street, even though there's a lot of buildings there, it is still near the river and I hear them in the trees, like in front of the Starbucks and, um, and just past um, uh, Zaza's and, and uh, by uh, Kilwins, they're in those trees too. And I'm sure there are other places as well, but that's just where I've been hearing them uh, recently. The lyrics indicated to me, it sounds kind of like the rattle is broken. It's got a kind of a coarse tone. Oh, ah, hold on. Let's see if we can get that to play. See how it's kind of rattly? It's rattly. We'll play it again. It's a little bit shorter, Paul. There we go. Now it's like, okay. so it can go up to a minute. And again, as we talked about in weeks past, these guys, they're not rubbing wings together. They're not rubbing legs together. What they're doing is, um, and it's only the males that are doing this, they're moving uh, the ribs uh, on the sides of their body. And they, they kind of pop them in and out and it makes these really distinctive calls. So even though the species can be hard to differentiate by what they look like, um, their calls are, are really distinctive. Um, I kind of gave the answer to this next question away, but why are they doing this? Um, all right, I got to play this just because this is a movie I, I grew up watching. I will answer to late night WGN, they showed it all the time back in the 70s. Um, Jeanette McDonald, Nelson Eddy, uh, Indian Love Calls, the movie is also called Rosemary. Um, he's a Mountie, uh, she's up in Canada. They uh, didn't have telephones, they would sing to each other just as the natives up there supposedly did, they would sing back and forth. Well, um, the cicadas are doing the same thing except um, it's only the Nelson Eddies that are doing the singing. There's no Jeanette McDonald answering because the female cicadas are doing the listening. But whenever I hear a cicada, I'm always thinking of these guys singing of their love for each other. I will answer to... Yeah, we don't need to hear him again. All right, so we're going to go to another corner of the insect world. Um, I don't know if it was last, it might have been two weeks ago. Uh, back when I had a voice before, we talked about lightning bugs and how they're in the ground and we want to be sensitive to those, those larvae uh, because they will soon be pupating and coming out. And so if you're going to be go doing some gardening, you want to, uh, you know, tread gently in case you uh, disturb the, the habitat of the, the baby lightning bugs. Um, and I wanted to this week introduce you to some of the adults because really we're seeing them in a lot of places. Our wet spring, I think, has really helped our uh, lightning bugs this year. We seem to be seeing a, a pretty good number of them in our parks, in our yards. Um, and there's uh, four different ones I want to show you. And we're going to start off actually with this one. When people see these little guys, and 10 millimeters, so we're talking a half inch or less. Um, and curiously enough, these are um, part of the family Lampyridae, which is what lightning bugs belong to, but they don't have any light. And the reason they don't have any light is because they're diurnal fireflies. Um, people see them uh, because they're so small and they don't light up. A lot of times they say, oh, it's a baby firefly. But if you've been attending good natured class, you know that baby fireflies don't look at all like the adults. They're little grubs that live in the ground and they glow. Now, these diurnal fireflies, they, instead of using flashing lights to communicate and, and find a mate, they actually use pheromones. So they've got pretty large antennae. Um, 
I seem to see a lot on goldenrod. I don't know if they have a preference for that plant. They don't really feed. They, they sip nectar, but they don't really feed at this stage of their life. Um, but they, uh, they, they have just been everywhere the last week or two. In fact, we did a program Friday night, our annual Firefly Fest. And um, before it got dark, I said, let's, instead of waiting until the, the flashing uh, fireflies come out, let's see if we can find any diurnal ones. And kids were filling their jars with you know, 5, 10, 15 of these diurnal fireflies. So really, really big year for them. Um, I have to say, I don't really know how you tell the difference um, between the different species. Um, there's at least three different uh, uh, genera, Lucidota, Elicnia, and Pyropigia. Uh, bright and clear, uh, lamp-like, and then the, the pyros are my favorite because it means fire butt in Greek. <laughs> Um, now, uh, these do glow as juveniles in their larval stage, they will glow, but as adults, um, they might have a very, very faint organ, but flashing and light is not part of their, uh, or doesn't play much of a role in their adult communications. So, um, that's baby firefly number one. Now, we also have, uh, baby firefly number two. Um, and again, less than half an inch long. These are very, very small. <clears throat> I learned the species is Photinus marginellus, <clears throat> but there's another species called Curtatus. So they've kind of lumped the two. Uh, you really have to get into the nitty gritty parts of the firefly, something you need a, a lot of uh, magnification to see. A lot of times you're looking at some kind of personal parts. Uh, we just call them, I just call it marginellus um, because again, that was how I learned it. Um, and these are very, very small, but they do light up. Um, they tend to be more in, in wooded areas along the edges of wood. So if you live in an area where you've got a lot of mature trees with a nice uh, thick understory below it, chances are you've got uh, marginellus uh, nearby. Uh, and then we get into our, our more typical lightning bugs. Um, so top right is uh, pyralis. Um, some people call it the lawn firefly. Some people call it the big dipper, which we'll see in a minute why they call it that. Um, but these are really, uh, these are pretty much everywhere. If you've got a lot of fireflies in your yard and they're flashing around, they're, they're, they're not hovering in the, the dense underbrush if they're in the middle of the yard. Um, and they, they have a, a light that kind of goes upward in a sort of a J stroke. Uh, that's, that's the pyralis uh, or lawn firefly. Um, and then we have um, the big guys. Uh, the, so the um, lawn fireflies are you know, a little more than half an inch. Uh, the Photurus species, and I believe it's lucid crescents that we have around here, but that's kind of a guess because again, these fireflies, it's can be very difficult to tell between species, but uh, up to 20 millimeters, which is up uh, two centimeters, which is um, getting close to an inch. Um, they're they're uh, uh, huskier. You can see there's some differences in the markings. Now, this um, piece above the firefly's head, that's called the pronotum, and it kind of helps protect the very, very large eyes that are underneath. You can see some differences here in the margins. This has a lot more yellow on Photurus. Um, you can see that in the, the back of the, the wing coverings too, which, by the way, fireflies are beetles, so they've got those leathery, uh, that first pair of wings is, is kind of leathery, and um, the margins are a little more decorative. Um, and they are, there's some ridges here that you don't see in the Photinus fireflies. But these are um, big, hefty fireflies. A um, little bit slower moving because they're larger and they have a really uh, kind of bizarre twist. You can see I put femme fatale there. Uh, the Photurus fireflies 
So fireflies, the reason they flash, the, 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 the night flying ones flash back and forth so they can find a mate. Generally speaking, if there's a firefly flying, it's a male. And if there's one that's stationary and flashing, it's a female. And the male has a very species specific way that he flashes. And the female will respond, not necessarily in the same flashing pattern, but um, within a kind of a prescribed or innate uh, length of time. So um, say it's three seconds, say, uh, you know, male flies by, does his flash, and within three seconds he gets a response. He knows that that's the female for him. Well, for tourists, what uh, the femme fatales do is they kind of abscond that response time from other species and they'll lure in this, uh, males of other kinds of fireflies. And uh, when they get uh, close enough in, the females, um, they pounce and they eat them. And it's, it's really bizarre because um, generally speaking, fireflies as adults don't eat a whole lot. So the fact that she's, um, A, you know, being deceptive in her, you know, or, you know, mimicking the uh, flash patterns of other species and then consuming those other species, uh, it's not that she's taking that extra protein and using that to make her eggs. Now maybe there's a larger nutrient requirement because it's a larger bug. I don't know, but it's a, it's a, really kind of a, a weird twist on the whole happy firefly scene. Um, we do see it sometimes during our firefly programs because we found all three of these night flying species um, when we're out uh, with our, our family groups. And I would say just about every year, someone finds a photurus and just about every year, someone finds a marginellus. And some years those are in the same container. And at the end, when we right before we let everybody go, we look to see what we've caught. And uh, on several occasions, Photurus has started eating marginellus before the program's over. So kind of, it's, it's one of those, you know, fascinating kind of a train wreck kind of thing where you don't want to look, but then you, you kind of want to look. And um, it's uh, just a, a neat sidebar to uh, the story of our otherwise mild-mannered fireflies. Now I did do just a quick slide here so you can get an idea of how these um, bugs flash. I mentioned um, Pyralis is the J, uh, is also called the Big Dipper because um, it makes this J, uh, upward sweeping J stroke to its flash. Um, it's somewhat slow moving as it, as it flies up and the light, the light comes on as it moves forward and upward. So that's, uh, that's our, our most common species, the one we have in, in our yards and everything. Now little marginalis, they tend to be, uh, they're kind of hopping around in the shrubs or the brush uh, along the woodland edges. Uh, they like a very moist environment, so you're not going to really see them flying around real far from uh, the moisture in the leaves. But they make, uh, it's almost, a, almost like a Morse code dot, so a quick flash about a half of a second, um, but then it, it moves. So uh, the, the males will flash, hop, flash, hop, flash, hop, um, in hopes of hopping along and finding themselves a female. Now this next one, I kind of struggled. I wasn't sure how to illustrate a crescendo with my limited um, graphic skills. So what I did was, uh, Basically, the uh, femme fatales or the lucicrescents, the photurus species, their light just gets brighter. So um, I did that by making it get bigger. It doesn't really get bigger, it just gets brighter, but you, you get the idea. Lucicrescens, crescendo, kind of sounds the same, but um, it's a, a kind of a hovering light that gets bigger. That makes sense. So now you know, those are the most likely suspects um, of what you'll find um, in your yard and um, in our nearby parks and preserves. All right, now we're gonna, we're gonna switch gears again. We're gonna go back to mammals. Um, we're gonna talk about bats. Um, 
Now, we're going to start off, uh, so we've got, in this area, we've got, uh, well, I guess in the state of Illinois, we've got 13 bat species, but here in eastern Kane County, there's really four, um, but you can reliably count on having nearby or maybe even have a chance of seeing if they're flying at night. Um, <coughs> two of them fall into the group that we would call the colonial species, which means they live in colonies. They're not little pilgrims, they're not, you know, Puritans from the colonial days. They're colonial bats in the fact that they live in colonies. Um, those would be the big brown bats and the little brown bats. We'll probably talk about them some other time. We're not gonna talk much about them tonight. We're gonna focus on the solitary bats. We've got a couple species of those around here. And uh, we're gonna start off with the hoary bat. And the hoary bat, this is a picture that someone sent me um, actually several years ago now. This was taken at Leroy Oaks. Um, the bat was just kind of hanging by one foot in um, a shrub. Looks like, uh, is that raspberry? No. Something with thorns. Um, just, you know, dangling by one leg. And this, it, you couldn't ask for a better textbook picture of how these bats behave. Um, they're nighttime flyers, as all of our insectivorous bats are, and they need to kind of lay low during the day. As solitary tree bats, they um, will find a branch and they'll hang very still, usually adopt this one legged posture so that they can and turn in the breeze. So they look for all the world like a dead leaf or a bit of bark that's come down or maybe even like the shadows, you know, the way um, uh, when you've got sun dappled leaves on a, on a summer day, um, that their coloring really helps them blend in well. And I remember the gentleman who sent me this picture was like, I looked at this at first I, I thought it was just a shadow, and then I looked again and I realized it was a bat. Now, hoary bats, as you can see, they're, they're pretty hairy. Um, they're, now, I was a little surprised to learn that the uh, genus has changed. The taxonomists, you know, they seem like they're always changing things. Orestes is the new, or I would consider the new genus for these bats, but Laceurus is what I learned them as. Um, and it means uh, that they're a, a hairy bat. So hairy, hoary actually refers to this kind of frosting uh, coloration that they have, which is also referenced in their uh, species name. Cenarius means ash colored. So they, they look kind of um, <clears throat> like they had uh, frosted highlights put on their dark fur. And they've got some yellow around their face which we're actually going to see uh, in this next photo. Um, so I grabbed this, I asked the woman if I could use this picture. This was on a, a Facebook page called Suburban Wildlife. This was about a week ago. And uh, the woman posted, this guy was very sick. Not sure if he had rabies, but he was acting very aggressively and he even fell at one point. He used a large stick to help him back into the branches that he fell from, and he started biting the branch. I tried to call King County, but there was nobody there till Monday. And I read that, and I thought, oh my goodness. Now, if we go back to the Leroy Oaks hoary bat. So this is what they do. They just hang out in trees, um, and they try not to call attention to themselves. And I suspect what happened was she got a little too close. And this bat was right so a little uh, agitated at having been disturbed. That's the way I am when I get woken up when I don't want to be. Um, you can see the, the yellow around the face here. You can see the hoary, um, the frosted look to the, um, the fur. Um, <clears throat> I responded to her right away and said, I don't think it's sick. I don't think it's being aggressive. I think it's being defensive. And I think it probably just wanted to sleep. Um, and she, she said, well, that actually makes sense because that's what it did after it got put back up in the tree. So um, I guess it's just kind of a heads up. Now, 
the the books like uh, Hoffmeister and, and some other books, they say that um, uh, hoary bats will sleep between three and um, uh, six meters, or maybe it's three and nine meters. So we're talking like you know ten feet and more up in the air. But uh, the gentleman who found the hoary bat at Leroy Oaks, uh, he said it was pretty much right at eye level. This woman found this bat pretty much right at eye level. So they can occur uh, lower in the trees. They're just a, a, a cool bat with a really cool life story too. Um, this is their migration pattern. They uh, go, uh, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say every single hoary bat, but an awful lot of them migrate down to South America for the winter. Um, now there are records of hoary bats overwintering. They, they are a, a kind of a chubbier bat than our, our colonial little brown and big brown bats. Um, and sometimes they can withstand as long as their bodies, um, if they can find a place where they can stay above freezing, they can go into a, a state of hibernation and survive. Uh, and there are records of them doing that uh, because this might sound lovely, you know, to go down and, and, you know, spend winter around the equator, but it is very taxing. Think of it as putting miles on your car, you'd be putting miles on your little wings. So, so they do, uh, they don't always migrate down south. They sometimes will stay closer to where their summer range is. But um, I think because of this uh, propensity for migration, that a lot of them do go to uh, uh, fly south for the winter, um, they end up getting killed by uh, wind turbines. And this is something there's kind of a, they do kill birds, no, they don't kill birds. Yes, they do kill bats, no, they don't kill bats. Um, I'm wondering, like with a, bat kills, if we're looking at maybe some species are more prone than others, it, it, hoary bats are definitely, uh, there's more hoary bats being killed by wind turbines than turbines than other types of bats. So um, researchers aren't exactly sure if it's, they're mistaking these for trees or if it has something to do with that long distance migration, um, but they do have a little bit of a problem uh, with these wind turbines. Um, since we're talking about bats that live in trees, um, I did want to mention just briefly a red bat, very common in this area as well. We actually see these uh, sometimes flying over hickory nose. They're big enough. Um, I like the hoary bat. They are a chunky bat. Uh, they've got a little bit of white on their chest. Um, in a, a distinct reddish color, and they do that cool hang by one leg trick, just like the hoary bats do. Um, this is not my photo. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't find the picture that I took. I've only seen them one time and it was hanging up. It was actually in Southern Illinois. Um, and it looked for all the world like a brown leaf and it was dangling, it was kind of swaying in the wind. And it was actually a friend who pointed out that that is no leaf, that's a bat. So keep your eyes open. We have bats in our trees around here, and it would thrill me to no end to find that you guys had seen them. Do let me know. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of uh, uh, reader emails. Uh, this is from uh, Donna, uh, Debbie Nelson, and Debbie uh, wrote the other day, she goes, hey there. I was checking out my new red buds and I noticed these leaves. I looked it up immediately and I learned something new. I thought this would be an interesting post if you haven't already covered this issue. Take care and stay healthy. And so what uh, Debbie's referring to are these wild U-shaped chunks out of the leaves on her red bud. Now, um, I don't know, does anybody wanna use a, a comment to guess what might have done that? It's um, the, the uh, cuts are very smooth, uh, not jagged, um, they're pretty regular in their uh, loopy shapes. Anybody? Um, 
Well, boy, I should have added a drum roll. Um, it's the work of the leaf cutter bee. So let's go back. So the leaf cutter bee will come in and they will cut the leaves in these kind of C-shaped chunks and they fly away to a cavity of some sort. Now, sometimes it's a, a plant stem, uh, the bee houses, I know, I know a lot of people are installing, like this picture here shows the uh, bee house that we have with, called the pollinator tower at Hickory Knolls. It's stuffed with plant stems. And a leaf cutter bee will um, cut a chunk of leaf, fly it back to the cavity, whether it's in a plant stem. They will also, they, they also will dig in um, uh, potted plants that soil is loose and it's easy to um, push and, and make a cavity and they'll, they'll go down in there and they will line the uh, chamber where they lay their egg and where their larvae will grow. They will line it uh, with leaves. They make these uh, little cigar looking type cases for their young to grow in. And it's um, just kind of a, a cool twist, um, another side to our local pollinators. Uh, Leafcutter bees are, are pretty important in our area. They're one of uh, several native bees that uh, help pollinate our native flowers. Oops. And um, are just uh, not often seen, but the signs that they leave are often uh, unmistakable. So leafcutter bees are active right now in the area. All right, I got one more. Letter, and I, I, this was just so funny, I had to read it uh, to you. Um, this is from uh, Greg, Sang Greg Sangstock in St. Charles. Greg writes, a couple of nights ago, my wife came down to my office looking like she'd seen a guy in a, <laughs> a, guy in a ski mask with a chainsaw. In retrospect, she was amazingly calm. I'm proud of her. She asked if I could dispatch a bug for her, but it was obvious this was no daddy long legs or creepy centipede. I went upstairs to find a huge four, four use huge, huge beetle with killer pinchers trying to crawl out of our bathroom sink. This monster was no less than two inches long and an inch wide. We are only grateful that it couldn't get traction on the upward slope of the porcelain sink. I'm sorry to say that I didn't get a photo of this bad boy before I wrapped him in toilet paper and smashed him on the floor. This is probably not what you wanted to hear, but I'm not sure my wife would have been able to sleep had she known this thing was still alive and within a five mile radius of our house. <laughs> It did take all of my 200 plus pounds to crush its exoskeleton. <laughs> I Googled beetle with pinchers and I found the giant stag beetle that might meet the criteria for positive identification in a police lineup. <laughs> Later, my wife thought it might be a lesser beetle, uh, but you know how reliable eyewitnesses can be. <laughs> um, have you heard uh, or seen any giant stag beetles or lesser, lesser beetles in our area? Apparently they like woods, but we are in town. Would he have flown into our bathroom through an open window? Uh, the screen had been removed. I would hate to think he crawled up here. Uh, should I, more important, should I expect to see more of these? Thanks for any insight, Greg sends that. So Greg, as you can probably guess, Greg was referring to one of our stars from last week, the stag beetle. It is still stag beetle season. Uh, I've still got the ones that I found over by St. Pat's Church. Uh, I'm still looking for some females, so if you've seen any, let me know. Female stag beetles, so if you've seen any, uh, let me know, because I would love to, to get a colony of these started. Um, that wraps up this part. You know, I'm going to take this off the, uh, the share now, because uh, there is one more thing. And doggone if it's not about cicadas one more time. Um, I want to show this to you, if I can get this right. Okay, so let me, let me back up. So this, I was at my mom's, as I am every week, doing yard work, and I noticed the maple tree in front of her house had some dead leaves. 
and it didn't, you know, these didn't look like hail damage uh, from the storms we've had recently. It, it, um, there were a, a few patches like this, and they're, you don't usually see crispy leaves uh, this time of the year in July. And I thought, oh, you know what? It's periodical cicadas. There, there were some. I know there were, I, I saw the shed shells from about 50 or so in her yard. Well, so I, I got um, my dad's old pole saw and I, I broke this branch off and I brought it down. So can you see, see these marks on the stick, the stem here? That is the work of a female cicada. Um, it, it does kill the branch, but it's just the very tip of the, really the twigs out at the end, some new growth. Some people call it um, natural pruning, but um, her ovipositor, like we talked about a few weeks ago, it's like a sawzall, and it, it um, slices into the leaf, she deposits the eggs, the eggs develop, or they hatch within a, a couple of days, and the, uh, the nymphs uh, fall down to the ground and burrow into the soil. But um, I just thought this was, was really cool, and I wanted to share it, and it's gonna go back here in the collection with all the other nature I've got here in the office. Anyway, we just got a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, does anybody have anything to share? Any questions tonight? Anything you've been seeing? Any comments? Hi, Pam. How can you tell like the difference between a weasel and a mink? We seem to have minks from uh, time to time. Hold on. Mm. All right. Mink are bigger. Okay. How big? So, um, wow. So, your bodied, um, dark, very dark fur. The only white on the mink, there'll be a little bit usually on the chin and maybe a little bit on the tummy, but the okay. chest and everything is dark. Um, That's too big. This we dark. have something that looks like a like a ground squirrel. We always call them chipmunks, but it has a long body. Does it have stripes on its back? Yeah, it does have some sort of alteration does it, of color. Does it have, if it's got like the alternating solid stripes and then dots, solid stripe and dot, um, it might be a 13 line ground squirrel. Really? Um, do you live... Um, Kay, do you live near like uh, grassy areas or do you live near? Yeah, and there's uh, detention ponds and a wildlife pond and stuff like that. Okay, yeah, because 13 line ground squirrels like grassier. Uh, like at Hickory Knolls, we have 13 line ground squirrels in the um, garden plot area, and then we have chipmunks in the woods. Okay. They're smaller. Right. Um, ground squirrels are bigger. In the, the markings, gosh, I wish I had a, a got Hoffmeister right here. All right, I, I found one on eBay. Oh, okay. You gonna buy one? Yeah, three dollars <laughs> plus three ninety five for shipping. <laughs> um, but yeah, they. Um, uh, I would say it sounds like a ground squirrel. Thirteen like Okay. Ground. And then yeah, for your main. Uh, they look very now. So this, um, it's getting a weird light on it. It's a very dark brown. You can see it better on the tail. Right. Dark brown. And you know, I shouldn't toss out. I, I should toss out. Um, so I've been doing working in this field for about twenty years, and in those twenty years, on two separate occasions, we actually found ferrets that mm -hmm. people have let go. Uh, one was at. Uh, Red Oak, where I used to work in uh, North Aurora, and one was up here at Fearson Creek Fen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was clear these were not wild animals. The, the ferret, the one at Red Oak actually ran past me and ran in the building. It was a cold day and somebody must have dumped it. And people do that all the time. They dump their pets in their parks and it ran inside the nature center because it was cold. Um, that I rehomed to a friend. Uh, the one I found up at um, Pearson Creek Fen, I had weird kind of growth on its chin. Um, 
couldn't find anybody that wanted a pet ferret, so I took it over to Anderson Animal Shelter, and then they there was a ferret rescue that they called. But um, ferrets have the same, they're in the same family, they've got the same kind of body. Right. Um, they're the, like, they're going to act like a pet. They're going to act like they're they're lost, like they're cold, they're hungry, they're tired. But, you know, like a lost puppy or kitten would act. Um, so they, they do happen from time to time. I haven't found one in a while, but that, that sadly it does happen. Um, yeah, mink are, mink are larger and darker. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what I yeah, kind of thought, but somebody in our neighborhood that, that's like a native person from this area said they were minks, but they're not. Well, in, in, um, you know, when, when Neil Hancock called about the weasel under his porch, I was trying to convince him it was a mink because I hadn't had anybody tell me they had a weasel move. And mink are really, uh, especially if you live near a retention pond or the river or one of our creeks, there's, um, they're common, they're, they're rarely seen, but they're, they're kind of everywhere. Um, because okay. um, they, uh, there's a lot of food for them. They eat a lot of uh, frogs and crayfish and fish. Um, and then backyard chicken keeping has kind of led to rise of mink moving away. Uh, some mink will dare to move away from the water and they'll go and raid a, a chicken coop. Huh, thanks very much. You bet. <laughs> Anybody else? Mm -mm. Well, all right then. Uh, we're coming up on nine o'clock. Uh, we'll wrap up another hour of good natured. Um, got one more screen to share here. It's our lineup for next week. Um, I, uh, let's see, we'll go to the current slide. Um, so next week, um, we're gonna take a walk at Delnor Woods. Uh, we're gonna see some pollinators in action. Uh, got some cool footage of a couple, uh, well, one sort of unusual insect and then a fairly common one, but really watch how they work those flowers and, and uh, make sure that those flowers are going to be able to turn uh, into seeds. Uh, some neat stuff going on over at Delnor Woods. And we're going to explore a little bit about walking stick insects. Got another round, uh, thanks to a phone call I got the other day, we're going to play another round of Why Am I So Itchy? And then um, we've got uh, another new segment we're going to try. It's called What's in the Freezer? And <laughs> some fun things we're going to explore there as well. So really appreciate you guys spending an hour with me this evening. Uh, always a pleasure to see everybody. And uh, hopefully see you again next week. Thanks, Pam. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Pam. Hi, everybody. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Bye, Pam. Thanks. Thanks. In the chat, but maybe you can do that next week. Yeah. <laughs>